never knew how to tell you. I would tell be able what? to talk about my Can life. You what? Can I, I ever loved a lot. Yeah, I have a two yeah, arms. You want me to say it out loud? We um, were considered two-spirit people, which right. means that we're all special because within us we have the male and the female, and that gives us a special way to look at the world and to see how things are happening. So it's important, I think, for, for gay people to look at that tradition of being two-spirit people. You're not less than other people, you're more than more other than, people, yes. and have a deeper understanding of the, of the whole picture. The word Burdash is actually originally from a Persian term that comes out of what is now present-day Iran. And it was a term for a Katamite, a male uh, slave who was kept for sexual purposes. During the Crusades, the Europeans brought it back to Europe, the terminology, but kind of changing the pronunciation. So it goes into Italy and to Spain and into France. And then when the French fur traders, trappers, missionaries, explorers came in contact with Indian people who were different, that was the term that they used. Actually, of course, there's a whole bunch of different Native American languages, and none of them uses either of those words. And none of them uses the term Burdash. None of them uses the term Amazon. None of them uses any of those kind of terms. The uh, Apaches have a word called Heokia, which is the tradition of being uh, a two-spirited person. Then my mom's language in Sahaptan, the word is Wakha. My mom told me about three years ago what the term in our northern Paiute uh, language uh, was, and the word is tibuds. Well, I wish I knew a lot of, more about the tibuds growing up. I, at the time, she told me about the, the word that described my role in history. I was upset with her because I asked her, why wasn't I given that? opportunity. In the Great Basin tribes, they call it the basket and the bow ritual or ceremony, where a young man at the age of puberty was given that choice, like women, was given that choice between the basket and the bow. They went for the bow. It meant that that person throughout that person's life will carry on as, quote, as a man. Uh, and that the basket, if a man, little boy picked up the basket, he was to carry on the role as, as the two-gendered person, the two-spirited person. In the old tribal ways, and actually, what I didn't know then but I know now, is that even in contemporary communities where people are pretty traditional, even today, there's a, a fairly serious breakdown of gender roles. It's gender roles, it's not sexual roles. Do you see what I mean? It has little to do with biology. It has a great deal to do with how you function in the community. The woman, of course, if she was prone to be of a masculine nature, would start taking on the role of a masculine, a more masculine uh, identity, such as being interested in hunting, uh, being interested in all manly activities, warfare, counting coup, that type of thing, whereas the male Burdash, who, who expressed uh, feminine characteristics, would have, take a great interest in householdly duties, such as uh, hide tanning and doing beadwork and quill work, um, learning songs, that type of a, of a, of a thing. We were, um, lived in the late 19th century. Um, the Zuni term for Burdash was Khlamana. Uh, and uh, we were, um, in many ways, was an exceptional Khlamana or Burdash uh, and uh, stood out in most of the traits or skills associated with Burdashes in Zuni culture. Um, he was an accomplished artist, an expert in um, a variety of Zuni religious lore. Uh, he participated in the male um, Gachina Society, which are the masked dancers, 
uh, and at the same time he was a, um, uh, he did domestic work and he was an expert potter and weaver. And when they buried him, they prepared the body in the normal way and they dressed him in his normal female clothes, but they also put um, male cotton trousers over his legs so that he had both male and female clothes on. Nobody at Zuni ever forgot that Weibo was a man. And when they were buried, they recognized that he started out as a man. And at the same time, he was buried if, with the symbols that he acquired based on his, the preference for the activities that he wanted to do. Um, and that it also has to do with, with the Zuni ideas about uh, the raw and the cooked. Uh, and those are words, um, akna and, and chakpin, that the Zunis actually use, raw and cooked to sort of categorize a whole variety of, of distinctions in their, in their world. Um, and uh, one of those distinctions is, is uh, between the person who is socialized as a Zuni and the person who is not, uh, including young people and newborn infants who are considered raw. Uh, when they go through life and they go through religious initiation ceremonies, they become cooked, cooked people. Uh, when you die, you become a raw person again. So when we were died, as a raw person, he was male. That's how he started out. So that was recognized. As a cooked person, he uh, combined that with female activity. So they buried him with both, uh, both clothes, and then they put him on the male side of the cemetery um, to acknowledge that he was raw. He was returning to the spirit world, um, which doesn't have fixed forms, including male or female forms that are necessarily fixed. In our belief systems, a person who has the qualities of both male and female is a person that can transcend both the physical and the spiritual world and therefore is a conduit is beyond what most people call shaman but is a conduit between both the physical and the spiritual world and therefore it's what would be called a, um, a gift and if you look at it as a gift well, then you can find your place in the world. The issue to be a medicine person means you see more than the ordinary person sees. And to be that kind of person means that there's some kind of balance or interaction between the male and female elements. So if you're only a man, you'll only see the way a man sees. And if you're only a woman, you'll only see the way a woman sees. But to be wakla or wingte or natle or bote, chlamana, any of those terms in the native people means that you see further because you can see in both directions. The human beings don't require a boy to be a warrior if he ain't got the temperament for it. And Little Horse didn't. If he wanted to stay behind with the women, that was all right with the human beings. Um, in most cases, um, Burdashas were noted by family, especially their, fe their, their uh, female relatives, mother and grandmothers, um, by the age of five, six, or seven because of the things that they were showing that they liked to do already, the kind of activities that they did. It was based on that, the, the activities and the, the gender of the activities rather than um, sexuality per se. Uh, and so they spotted it at a very early age. Um, and as that became confirmed in their minds, then uh, the, the child would receive the sort of training and socializing that was considered appropriate for a Burdash. Little big man. It was Little Horse, the boy who didn't want to fight the pony. Don't you remember me? Hurts me in my heart. I think I'll cry. He'd become a Himane, for which there ain't no English word. And he was a good one, too. Human beings thought a lot of him. The whole issue that if you are a man and you have a sexual relationship with a Burdash, you're not having sex with another man, you're having sex with a Burdash. And if you're a woman who has sex with a burdash, 
You're not having sex with a man, you're having sex with a Burdash. You're not having sex with a woman, you're having sex with a Burdash. So the partners of the Burdash technically are never homosexual because they're not having sex with their same gender. Interestingly enough, a number of um, traditional cultures saw it to be inappropriate for Burdash to have sex with another Burdash. And that was considered unnatural. You look tired, little big man. Do you want to come into my teepee and rest on soft furs? Why don't you live with me and I'll be your wife? Thank you for inviting me. Well, I've got to fix my hair to sing tonight. Goodbye, little big man. Goodbye, little horse. Well, the way that I think about it is that if you think about a stick, that has male on one end and female on the other end. Sexuality or gender is the same stick, but you have opposite ends. And this is the category you get caught in in European tradition in the sense of either or, straight or gay, and male or female. But if you take those two ends and you bend them together so you form a circle, and Native American people are much more into circles than they are into lines, then you end up with the possibility of an infinite number of points along that circle, and people change during different times in their life, that you're not trapped into only one way of thinking or only one way of being. In our language, it's called, we're, we're, our name is Tenawai, which means literally man-woman, having the aspects of both. And the word gay in, in Western society, um, to me, has, it, it isn't what our, we're about. Because for one thing, our tradition is based on the spiritual and um, with the word gay on the other hand um, in the Western context means a lot more than that it isn't based on the spiritual it's based on the physical and that's the difference between night and day I think also within the tradition that we get trapped a lot of times because being forced to speak in English we're herded into using certain kinds of terminology. So a lot of people embrace the Burdash tradition as a kind of gay role model from a different culture. But I think about it, if there's a circle here that represents the Burdash tradition and a circle here that represents the gay, they overlap, but they're not on top of one another. So they're elements that both share. And it may be, again, the issue of trying to refer to things that aren't really translatable when I was old enough to, to know that I was what they call a lesbian, um, <clears throat> first of all, I went to a dictionary and looked up the word to see if I was. That was the only way I could figure it out. <laughs> and I thought, well, I guess I'm not. <laughs> but um, I do have very, but I know I'm different. Uh, I know who I love. And I know why I love this person, it was, there was a woman I was very much in love with at the time. And uh, so I would say that I, I, I was, I always knew I was a lesbian ever since I was a little kid, and I don't know how I knew that, I just knew it. And um, I'm very dissatisfied with, with that, with, I'm still very dissatisfied with the terminology. Um, because I think it is a spiritual choice. I mean, I think that I knew what I was and I decided that's what I'm going to be. I'm not going to be different than I am. I'm not going to pretend to have feelings, erotic feelings about men when I don't have those feelings, when it's not possible for me to feel that way. I knew I, I was different at a very early age. I would say about six or seven or eight. Don't ask me how. But I was very attracted to my own uh, male counterpart um, and I was attracted to older men, so I knew at a very early age I was different. Um, but when I came out here to California in 74, 75, when I got a chance and an opportunity to meet other lesbian, gay, Indian people, and when we sat down to talk and to share our history as tribal people, uh, that issue always came up. Hey, there is that role, traditional role that we played. Let's bring that role alive and let's make it happen. And I think that was the whole meaning, the whole purpose 
um, more so than a social and social and political reasons that we formed Gay America Indians is because of that that whole issue on history. Yeah. And even when I read some of the famous historian and famous anthropologists that wrote about the cross-dressing in, 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 in historical times, uh, their first contact with Native tribes, it's just like their journals are so much of what we're talking about today as lesbian, gay, as a movement as a, in general. So I think it's really important that uh, we carry on that tradition. In Living the Spirit, the anthology that Gay American Indians produced, the opening quotation is a passage from Judy Gron where she describes her reaction the first time she saw a flyer saying Gay American Indians is having an event and she describes how she, she put her, her face in her hands and cried because it, it removed any uh, last remaining sense that we didn't belong in the world and that we weren't everywhere. I think that there are people being raised even today in, in a number of, of tribal universes. I wouldn't say they were in such rural villages as I was, but they're in rural areas, not big cities. Um, and they're raised with complete acceptance if it turns out as they, as they reach puberty or whatever that they have that kind of preference, it's not a big deal. Because I've met some of their older relatives. And I've gotten, I've, I've received letters from people who were very afraid to come out. They were rural. Um, but then when they finally did, one of the holy people would say, hey, no problem, just live a decent life. You know, the problem isn't your sexuality, the problem is your ethics. That's what matters. You have to live a committed moral life. I don't care who it is that you're in love with. So, um, but it's a pretty mixed bag. There's still, there are a lot of reservations that are throwing queers off and won't let them come back. I know people who have been banished from the tribe for life and have been declared dead. So it's a very, very mixed bag. It's, it's pretty horrifying in a lot of respects because the, we're still going through all of the agonies of colonization and um, the remnants of the colonial mind that has been imposed upon us. When I came out, I didn't know much about the historical. I felt that I needed to tell her personally about who I was as a gay man, uh, and because I started our club in 75, and, and I felt that I didn't want to hear, have her hear it from a third party, so I really felt it was important to tell her. Mom and Dad threw me off my ranch on the reservation. They physically threw me off the ranch. And so, and of course, they rejected me for about a period of six months where my sister had to go back home and tell my family that you don't do that. That's our blood. That's our, that's your only son. If you're going to kick him off our ranch or you're going to kick him out of the family, then you might as well kick me out too. And my aunts, who were the Lebanese aunts, frequently talked about girls having crushes on each other, and I thought that was normal. Remember, my sister was a little older than me, and there was some girl she was chasing around, and my aunt said, she's got a crush on her, and it, it wasn't anything negative. It was, and so I, I just didn't quite understand that this was really abnormal. There's some part of me that did understand that it was abnormal, and that it was very dreadful. And that part of me tried to commit suicide when I figured out that I was queer. And so instead I got involved in my third disastrous marriage, no, my second disastrous marriage and my third disastrous marriage before I finally was able to say, hey, this is a bunch of garbage, you know. I don't have to kill myself over this. When I learned stuff about the bird ash tradition, I think, I, I guess I felt more comfortable. I mean, uh, reading, uh, I think it's Walter Williams' book and, uh, on uh, Spirit in the Flesh. That's... It's, that's an intriguing idea, this idea about balance, and I think in general that is, uh, that is true for most tribes, that, that that's, uh, that's something people are working for all the time, is to establish some sort of balance within their community, within the world, within themselves. And um, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how much of that is in the blood. You know, how much of that need to do that is in my blood, or how much of, uh, I guess I, I wouldn't have known how to think about myself without a concept like that in some ways. I would still be struggling. I'm not sure that balancing male and female in myself, which certainly I do, is, it's, I know that in the modern world it's, it's a fairly unique capacity because the modern world doesn't let it, you know. Um, not, not because it's unique. I think an awful lot of human beings do it. 
but um, I think that being able to recognize it and not try to suppress it or change it is a bit unique. And in that sense, there's something to teach, to be taught, or to be learned. Basically, it really feels like a choice that you make within. You know something about yourself. You know the truth about yourself. And if you want to, if you decide, I'm going to live with that truth, you've made a spiritual choice. And uh, <clears throat> that's, I think that's the best we can do. And I think that's the best we can teach anybody to do as well. One of the things that uh, Harry Hay once said um, when I was doing an interview with him was he talks about if, and my apologies to Harry in terms of paraphrasing, but basically as I understood what he was saying is that if you are a straight, particularly a white person in this society, particularly a straight white male, you don't have to think that everything is scripted for you. There are all the expectations of how to see the world, what your place is in it. Everything reinforces that in terms of movies, in terms of schools, books. But if you're different, because you are ethnically different and visibly different, if you are, in terms of your gender orientation or sexual orientation, different, then you can't follow the script. That you're constantly having to think and ad lib, try to figure out what your place is, how you relate to things in a different way. And it teaches you a completely different set of skills of thinking about things. And I think that's the way it is in terms of being too spirited as well, to try to figure out not what's automatic, but what's most appropriate for you, what feels best, both in terms of your gender as well as your sexuality.